it's a good thing I'm talking about pressure being the very first person up here. So my timing starts right now. There's the pressure. So I love the work that I do. We at IHHP have the opportunity to work with organizations to help them manage pressure. We help them build their emotional intelligence and their leadership capabilities. And I share that with you because whenever I'm done working with a group, a very interesting thing happens. They say, hopefully, thanks, that was great. And then they say, but you know who really needs this stuff? Our managers. So I'm like, okay, and I get all prepared and I'm nervous and I'm ready to work with these monsters that I've heard so many stories about. And then I go in and I work with them. And it turns out they're not monsters. In fact, what they are is just a bunch of human beings who are doing their very best, who are working under enormous amounts of pressure, who are also trying to figure out how to do more with less. And so I finish up with them, and then they finish, and they say, but you know who really needs this? You know, the folks at the top of the house. So I'm like, this is where the monsters must be hiding. I'm positive of this. And so I get ready, and I go in, and it's not monsters that I walk into. It is, again, a bunch of human beings working under enormous amounts of pressure. And I have a tremendous amount of empathy for these situations because I get to see all the pressure that these various levels within an organization are experiencing. But it's very hard for you to have that same empathy when you're in the heart of it, when you're working within that enormous amount of pressure, when you are in a time and resource strained environment. It's hard to stay connected to the big picture. It's hard to stay thoughtful and calm. It's hard to grant others grace, even though they're working in the exact same environment as you. And here's the thing, it's hard for us to do that, not because we are monsters, but, and it's not that we are unintelligent, unmotivated, and uncaring, but it is more about because these situations, they impact us. Pressure changes us. It changes us physiologically. It changes us from a neurochemistry perspective. And you're gonna hear a lot about this in a number of talks following. But you can imagine that in these pressure-filled moments, stress chemicals such as cortisol floods our system. Our emotional system kicks in, and all of this makes it very hard for us to think. It puts us in a state of high alertness, which is not very conducive to a great working environment. So I ask all of you out there, just a quick check-in, how many of you on a daily basis would say you experience some pressure in your workplace? I'll ask you to put your hand up if you do. Right? Okay, so good, I have something to talk to you about. This is a good thing. Our research at IHHP shows that about three quarters of you would say that you are under more pressure to do more with less today than you were about five years ago. Not surprising for most of us. What's interesting is that the majority of us actually think that we are better under pressure. We'll talk. What I find most surprising, though, is that for the rest of you who do not think you are better under pressure, who do not believe that other people are better under pressure, you still default to using pressure to motivate people to perform. It's a very interesting dynamic that goes on here, and it's specifically that piece, this idea that we're better under pressure or that we should use pressure to motivate people, to get them to work harder and faster in a more focused way that caught the eye of Harvard researcher and professor, Dr. Teresa Amabile. And her and her colleagues have spent the last 10 years looking at very specifically the impact time pressure has on our ability to be pr productive and to be creative. And I love the results that she has found. And it's just simply this. When we're under time pressure, we do get more done. The problem is less great work gets achieved. So if you think about this, what happens is we get so focused on the small, urgent, but uncritical, often mundane details that we lose focus of the big picture, the important and the meaningful things. We get tricked into actually thinking we are more productive in that moment because we start to mistake activity for creativity. And this is where we start to fall into trouble because we get so focused on getting things done that we lose sight of doing them really effectively. And this wouldn't be so bad, except what she's also found is that under pressure, there is actually a hangover effect of it. So if we, I'm in this environment, I'm giving this presentation to you, what her research shows is that tomorrow, I will actually be less creative and less productive tomorrow. And then the day after that. So this wouldn't be so bad if our work environments were environments where we had enough time and we had enough resources and not every priority was one of 15 priorities. 
But that's not the environment we're working in. And then we're asking people who are feeling drained to go in and be productive the next day. So they work longer hours. But all the things we're doing to actually be more productive are in fact making us less productive. And it's not just what we do. It's not just our results that are, are impacted by pressure. There is a famous study. It's an oldie but a goodie. And I'm sure a number of you know it. It's from 1973. Princeton University did the Good Samaritan study. And researchers were very interested in looking at what is the impact of time pressure on people's helping behaviors. So essentially, these researchers recruited a group of seminary students. So the idea was that probably these seminary students were predisposed to want to help people, so we would hope. And what they didn't know is that these researchers were looking to duplicate the Good Samaritan story to do this test. So for those of you who don't know, we can kind of describe in a very high level way. The Good Samaritan story is just about uh, a number of important religious leaders who walk by this gentleman who's on the ground who's obviously in need, but they don't stop to help him. And it's not until the Good Samaritan walks by that then the Good Samaritan stops and helps this person. Well. These students had no idea that they were going to be duplicating this scenario. So the researchers pulled them together, had them do a number of different things. They actually taught them the Good Samaritan story, and then they gave them a number of different tasks. But this is where the researchers got sneaky, because they gave them tasks that forced them to go across campus. And what the researchers did is there's a primary hallway they had to walk through. So they planted a man in the hallway that everybody had to walk by. And then they even instructed the man, I want you to cough twice and sigh to really show you are in need. And the results are fascinating. Because what they found, a number of different variables in place, but those students who were not under time pressure, so they had enough time, but they had to go across campus to do something, 63% of them stopped. OK, high or low, I'm not sure. But more fascinating, when students were told that they were under time pressure, they were actually running late, only 10% of them stopped to help this person in need. Not a high number. What we can pull from this is under pressure, we lose our ability to actually see what other people need from us. Under time pressure, we are less helpful. And here's the thing, I am guessing those seminary students are not monsters. They're not self-absorbed, uncaring people. But what did happen is that they were unaware of how pressure impacts them, impacts their perceptions, impacts their actions and their behaviors. And I'm guessing this fundamentally created that disconnect between their values and their actions. And if we then take that and we overlay this on this environment that we are working in, this more with less environment, it starts to become incredibly clear. We are not setting people up to be successful. Because it's not very fair to ask people who are drained of energy to be filled with empathy. Because even from a cognitive perspective, it takes mental energy to be empathetic. It's hard on our brain. And so as cortisol goes up, our ability to empathize goes down. And we found this in, in our studies too, because again and again, we hear the significance, the strategic need of empathy. And our results at IHHP, where we take uh, EI360, 360 information, and we found that regardless of industry, regardless of level within an organization that somebody is working within, those that are in the top 10% do three things incredibly well. They are very, very good at making sure that they are open to change, they are good at making sure they are non-judgmental in difficult situations, a precursor to empathy. And they are also very good at recognizing how their emotions impact them and impact others. So if you think about this environment, how do we actually foster more of that? How do we allow people to do more of that work? Because the reality is, pressure is not going to go away. It's not. And some pressure can help us do work, but too much long-term pressure without enough time, without enough resources, robs us of our ability to do great work, not only today, but in the future. So here's my challenge to you. How do we stop having the conversation about the short-term gains of doing more with less and acknowledge that there are long-term consequences to this type of environment? At the end of the day, don't feed the pressure monsters. They just get bigger and stronger. 
Instead, how can we nourish the human beings? How do we nourish the empathy, the energy, and the creativity of our people? Because I think that's where we have our greatest opportunity. Thank you.